Hello, and welcome to Shimmerblock, a skyblock map with a twist. Unlike most skyblocks, there's no trees or solidifier to get you started. You also won't find any chests to open or water to fish in. The world consists only of a small pool of shimmer encased in unbreakable obsidian, and further out, a single lizard block, wall, and altar for spawning golem. Is it even possible to progress in such a world? How can I go from such a minimal start, with nothing but some copper tools, to eventually defeating the Moon Lord. Well, the core mechanic of this map is in the name, Shimmer. I start by throwing my copper tools into the liquid, giving me three copper ore and two wood. I can place these down to expand my platform a bit, but what next? I now have nothing, not even a pickaxe to break the blocks I've placed down. The answer is death. A few moments later. If you're one of the five people on Earth that have ever played Terraria on medium core, then you'll know that after you die, you respawn with a new set of starter tools. Without this mechanic, the entire map would be impossible. Dying to the void takes time though, so after respawning, I use some of the wood I've gathered to make a platform above me for easy fall damage. This makes the process of dying and respawning much faster allowing me to begin building out a platform for mobs to spawn. Every time a slime spawns, it has a chance of containing additional items within it. These can be many things, from ores and potions to bombs and rope. In a normal world, it would be very easy to forget about these drops. However, in a world as limited as this, those same drops will prove invaluable. As an example, potions can be thrown into shimmer to get some of the materials used to craft them, which will allow me to obtain many useful items such as sand, cactus and herbs that would otherwise be impossible to get. For the next few days, I killed slimes while the sun was up, and myself when the sun was down. I eventually gathered enough materials for some basic crafting stations. By throwing copper ore into shimmer, I can get the stone necessary to make a furnace. This allows me to smelt some iron dropped from a slime, and use it to craft a chest meaning I can now stop worrying about losing my items if I die. The next day, I collect the money I've been stacking up from killing slimes. I almost have the 50 silver required for the merchant to spawn, so I build some basic housing for him in the guide. The first things I buy are an anvil and some rope, so that I can easily get to and from the cavern layer. Once there, I build a basic spawning platform. A while later, I find the skeleton merchant there, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Unfortunately, I left all my money at spawn so I can only buy a few of his bombs with the money dropped from some bats. Luckily, one bomb is all that's needed for the demolitionist, so I build an extra house to allow him to move in. I then shimmer some stone into dirt and combine this with the extra bombs I have to make dirt bombs. Over 4 hours into the playthrough, these dirt bombs are the first major step towards rebuilding the world, allowing me to easily gain blocks without having to die anymore.
After farming enough dirt for now, I descend into hell and build a mob spawning platform there. The lava slimes found here drop flowing lava when killed. This can be collected with a bucket crafted from the ores dropped by surface slimes. Throwing this lava bucket into shimmer transforms it into a honey bucket, which can then be thrown in again to get a water bucket. Using some basic water duplication, I can easily fill an area near spawn. With an adequate fishing spot created, I'm now one step closer to fishing, with the next issue to tackle being bait. There's a very small chance for critters such as worms and snails to spawn in the cavern layer, however most of the time hostile mobs will kill them before I can catch them. I can reduce the number of hostile mobs and increase the number of critter spawns by creating a town nearby. It may look a little dirty, but it's good enough for the demolitionist and guide. I also get lucky timing when it comes to the weather, as rain increases worm spawns by quite a bit. While it rains, I switch between catching bait and fishing. With this new method of resource production, I quickly make progress. As an added bonus to bait farming in the caverns, I also amass a lot of gem bunnies and squirrels, which can then be shimmered into gems. These give me access to all the gem staffs, a massive upgrade over my copper short sword. One of the other great things about shimmer is allowing you to get free reforges on crafted items. I can craft and uncraft my amethyst staff as much as I want until I get the reforge I like. With a better weapon to protect myself, I begin bridging to the right of spawn. Eventually I get to the ocean and lay down some sand from uncrafted potions. This makes it possible for the angler to spawn, who is probably one of the most important NPCs on this map. Completing fishing quests not only gives me access to better fishing gear, it also gives me additional bait and access to fishing, sonar and crate potions. For now, the biomes I can fish in are quite limited. I create a pool in the caverns and sky layer to cover some extra quest areas, but to get access to others I'll need some biome specific blocks. First on that list is the desert. From slime drops and fishing I've collected quite a few potions that can be decrafted into water bottles, empty bottles, glass and eventually sand. Getting a valid desert this way would be incredibly slow. But luckily for me there's a trick to getting infinite sand, antlions. I placed down all the sand I'd obtained so far and waited for one to spawn. I knew they were rare, but after a few days of waiting for one to spawn I knew something was wrong. It's at this point that I'd like to say a massive thanks to Freedbot and his Discord server. This is an excellent place to find information and ask questions about Terraria Skyblocks. I'd read somewhere that antlions required 40 sand blocks nearby to spawn but couldn't find exactly what nearby meant. The official wiki didn't even have this information, but Freedbot did, saving me hours of time waiting for an antlion spawn. Turns out the spawn rules only check 9 blocks horizontally, 
and as I only had 4 layers of sand, this maxed out at only 36 blocks. After adding an extra layer of sand, I was able to get an antline to spawn, allowing me to collect as much sand as I want. Freedbot also has a few skyblock maps of his own, including Shimmering Skies, another shimmer based skyblock which doesn't require a medium core character. I'll leave a link to his maps in the description if you want to check them out. After gathering enough sand to make an artificial desert, I made an island on the cusp of the ocean biome, thinking the oceans required sand for fishing in. Turns out that wasn't true, and being so near the ocean messed with the desert biome as well. Before I could relocate all this sand however, I was interrupted by a slime rain. The chances of a slime rain spawning this way is 2.4% each day, or approximately once every 17 hours, so I make the most of it and take down King Slime. With the diamond staff and the gear I'd obtained from fishing, the fight wasn't too difficult, although with only 100 health in master mode, I can never be too careful. Luckily, after another fishing session, I get my first life crystal from a golden crate. I won't be announcing every time I get a life crystal, but with all the fishing I'm doing in between cuts, you'll likely see my health gradually increase. I gather up the sand from my failed desert biome, then build an actually successful desert away from the ocean. At some point I plan on building more aesthetically, but not until I have access to more block types. Using some cobwebs I got from uncrafting danger sense potions, I make a bed so that I can sleep between fishing quests. At this point, the next major step in progression is gaining enough health to take down Skeletron or get a natural Eye of Cthulhu spawn, either of which would allow the Dryad to move in. With my current fishing gear this would take many many hours of grinding, not to mention a lot of wasted bait. By prioritising fishing quests now, I can improve my fishing gear to make the later grind more reasonable. After a few days of this cycle I get one of the most important quest rewards, the Golden Fishing Rod. This is a massive step up over the reinforced pole that I'd been using up until now, and almost makes fishing enjoyable. With rain comes increased fishing power, so I take the opportunity to grind through some real fishing whenever it rains. I spent a lot of time fishing in this playthrough. For reference, we're at around 30 hours of gameplay, and only one boss has been defeated. A lot of my playthroughs in the past have clocked in at around 30 hours overall, so by comparison this is incredibly slow progress. One particularly lucky fishing session brought in 5 gold crates, and opening those crates netted 4 life crystals, which is kind of insane given the 1 in 8 chance for each crate to contain one. This took me from 180 health to 260 health, comfortably over the threshold for the Eye of Cthulhu to spawn. For now though, it's back to fishing until the rain stops. There's something else I unlocked when I reached 200 health though. A while back, I took down some goblin scouts in the outer thirds of the world, and crafted a goblin battle standard. What I didn't know at the time was that you need 200 health to use this. Now that I meet this requirement, I spawn the goblins and take them down from the safety of my dirt box. Once the event is over, I rescue the goblin tinkerer from the caverns and buy some rocket boots and a tinkerer's workshop. Many of the accessories I have at this point can be combined to create more powerful upgrades and save on inventory space. Over the next few nights, I didn't get any natural IF Cthulhu spawns, but I didn't feel ready for Skeletron either. 
My weapons were some of the best I could get at this stage, but my armour was lacking in both defence and damage. I decided to farm for one of the only damage boosting accessories I could get at this stage, the magma stone. It took a lot longer than I expected, but after over 250 lava bats killed, I finally got one. After reforging some of my gear and taking some potions, I was finally ready for the first real boss fight of the playthrough. 